the civilian employees of the U.S. Air Force. They're not in the military, yet they take the same oath. They don't wear the uniform, but they stand shoulder to shoulder with those who do. They're patriotic, hardworking Americans. They are the everyday heroes of Air Force civilian service. Forces joined. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Air Force Civilian Services live webinar, Aim Higher. I'm your host, AFCS Marketing and Brand Management Specialist, Ryan Schneider. For tonight's webinar, High Spirits, we're going to explore the exceptional work culture and opportunities that await the civilian employees of the world's most powerful Air Force. Civilian employees are key to the Air Force's success and an essential part of a proud tradition, contributing to the defense and security of our nation. From masterminding cutting edge technology and groundbreaking research to maintaining the equipment and infrastructure the Air Force relies on, civilian airmen play a key role in this mission-driven culture you're not likely to find anywhere else on the planet. At AFCS, you'll find unparalleled opportunities for growth and development as an integral part of a unique culture that emphasizes collaboration, innovation, camaraderie, and an unwavering pride and dedication toward our shared mission. Beyond the workplace, you'll find a strong sense of community and support. The Air Force values diversity and inclusion, fostering an environment where everyone's voice is heard and respected. Today, we're joined by the woman that laid the foundation for all my recruiting experience, Ms. Maggie Silva, Program Manager for AFCS's Palace Acquire or PAC and Copper Cap COP internship programs for recent college graduates. In addition, we're also joined by the amazing and talented Brenna Sear, Program Manager for AFCS's Premier College Internship Program, or PSIP, for current students. Before I have these two extraordinary AFCS employees introduce themselves, let's take a moment for the first of tonight's two polls to get to know you, our audience. Poll number one, what best describes your current status? Is it A, college student or recent college graduate, professional in the private sector, current government employee, veteran or active duty, or other. We're gonna take a few minutes to let y'all punch in your answers, and then we'll see if we can review those here. Looks like 54% of you said college student or recent college graduate, 23% said professional in the private sector, with 10% a current government employee, welcome brethren and sisters, 5% veteran or active duty, hoo and 9% other, so thank you for that. We appreciate your candor. In addition to letting our guests get a better feel for who's out there this evening, your answers also help us tailor our programming and content to better serve your needs in the future. But as you've undoubtedly gleaned from the questions, you get a sense for just how diverse Air Force Civilian Service is. With a healthy mix of veterans, corporate professionals, and students and recent grads from every walk of life and background. Wherever you are on your career trajectory, chances are AFCS has positions perfectly suited for you. Now let's get back to our guests. Maggie and Brenna, if you'd be so kind, please take a moment to introduce yourselves and share with the audience a little about, you know, how you came to where you are. Maggie, let's start with you. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you for the introduction. And thanks um, to everyone who joined, with, um, joined us tonight. Um, I've actually been a civilian for 10 years with the Air Force Civilian Service. Um, it goes by very quick. I retired from the Air Force after 24 years of service, and it's been an honor. Uh, I actually had the honor to serve as an enlisted member first and then an officer. I guess you could say I've had the trifecta. I currently am the Palace Acquire and Copper Cap Program Manager here at the Air Force Personnel Center in San Antonio, Texas. Um, our, my program is for recent graduate um, recent graduates, and the goal is to place these individuals immediately into middle management and leadership positions to help them develop and grow into a future air and space force leader. Awesome. Well, thank you, Maggie, for your service, for everything that you taught me. <laughs> <laughs> AFCS gets a lot of former military because they're already familiar with the culture and the roles that we have here. But by no means does someone have to be a veteran to land a job as a civilian employee of the Air Force. What was your role, Maggie, during active duty? Well, I did a few roles, but let me, let me start off with how I started. Um, way back in the day, I actually, I did receive a track scholarship. I used to be super fast, um, used to be, 
but I really, really, really wanted to get married at the time. And I was looking for something called job security. I was looking for job security, like a roof over my head, food in my belly and a steady paycheck. So I looked around and guess what? The Air Force was staring right at me. Um, so I joined, joined right out of high school. I was the inventory management specialist, which falls under logistics. And I absolutely loved it. I loved it so much. I thought and felt that everybody should just join the Air Force. I would call my dad um, weekly, you know, because back in the day we didn't have cell phones and it was charged by the minute. So I'd call my dad and say, hey, this is just awesome. You know, I love it. I love it. I love it. And he'd be like, that's good. That's good. You know, um, but anyway, he would feel my passion. and I was just very passionate. So um, at the very first opportunity I had, I became a recruiter um, and I loved, loved, loved it. And I still do. Um, I excelled at it. I was really good at it because I believed in the product I was selling. In fact, um, I think if you cut me, I might actually bleed blue. <laughs> I, I've seen it. <laughs> it's It was a life changer for me, not just for me, but for my family. Um, and then I had the privilege of being an Air Force recruiting school instructor. And that's where I met you, Ryan. That was a while ago. It was what, 20 plus years ago, you were a young senior airman. Um, time flies. But um, since then, and, you know, the Air Force is all about growth, whether you're a civilian or active duty, I was actually encouraged, very um, highly encouraged to continue on with my education because I was kind of feeling my education. And ultimately, I ended up applying and I was selected for officer as an officer and I went to OTS, Officer Training School. There I was commissioned and I became a personnel officer and it feels like I pretty much did everything under the sun, um, but I loved it. Um, I did continue to develop and grow, and um, I did things and saw things I never thought I would. Um, and I'd like to actually share just a couple of different experiences that I had and some of the highlights. First, I got to see the world. And as a civilian, you too can see the world. Um, but I did get to see the world. I've lived in so many different places, places like Arizona, a couple places in Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, and Phoenix, Arizona. I actually recruited in Arizona, in Chandler, Arizona. The big and beautiful state of Texas, which is where I am now, um, lived in Turkey. That's where my daughter was born, and she loves to brag about that. It is kind of cool. And got to travel all over Europe and see, see and support some pretty cool missions. One of my favorite missions, excuse me, actually one of my favorite memories um, was um, when I worked at 12th Air Force, and that was there at Davis Fontham Air Force Base. When, when the sad, awful earthquake um, of Haiti happened in 2010, um, you know, it just happened. I did work at the Commander's Action Group, just um, CAG, and I was working for the Air Force's Southern Commander, Air Force's Southern Command Commander. He was a three-star general, and his area of responsibility was Haiti. So um, that was, since it was in his AOR, everybody, bam, within just a few minutes, we had to go and support that humanitarian effort um, and the amazing mission and the flawless execution of getting all that out there was just, it was impeccable. And I got to be part of that. Um, so that was just, it was a sad event, but it was an amazing um, memory because that's what the Air Force does. It's just one of the many amazing things the Air Force does. Overall, I'm going to say the biggest, biggest love that I have is working and getting to meet all these amazing people. I've met and worked with people all over the world and I still stay in contact with them. And more importantly, supporting a mission bigger than any of us. Yeah. And it's just a rewarding experience. So with that said, that leads me back to why I'm so passionate about recruiting. I love what the Air Force does and what it stands for. And I just had to get back to it. So I just had to do anything, everything I could to get back into Air Force recruiting. So um, typically officer, officers don't recruit, but we do support, um, or when I was an officer, we do support that mission. I ended up at the Air Force Recruiting Service, AFRS, um, which is recruiting headquarters. And I did serve as a public affairs officer. So I got to work on some really cool projects, work on some sensitive issues. And most importantly, I got to showcase some amazing um, Air Force avenues and what we did to support the mission. And I got to continue to, to serve that mission. As you can see, Ryan, I've done quite a few different things and quite a few amazing things. So um, that's just a little bit of what I've done. <laughs> you know what? And it's all good, definitely. And your enthusiasm, honestly, since the day I've met you has been infectious. So it's it's good to have you on the show tonight. 
You know, um, you retired and you transitioned obviously out of the military, but here you are as a civilian employee for the Air Force. Can you go into just briefly how that kind of came about, how you became a civilian with AFCS? Yes, actually what happened was is I retired, right? I retired and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna just retire and just, you know, do nothing. <laughs> Or, well, that nothing turns into something, you know, I'm like, oh, we got to get up, you know, I, but I was missing that sense of purpose. And I, I really, I really missed it. So I was kind of scrolling on Facebook and um, I ran across a post that Barry Kowalt, who happens to work with you and your team um, from AFCS, he posted his old job and it kind of caught my eye. So what he was doing is he was um, posting his job. He was transitioning from that job from the San Antonio Mets, into, uh, which was the education service specialist. And I was reading about it and I'm like, what is this? And I was like, hey, it's supporting not just the Air Force, it was all the branches of service, which is important. So um, I dug into it, called and asked some questions. And I'm like, I like it. So I went ahead and took the job and, and loved it. Maybe I loved it a little too much because I wore myself down. Um, it was exhausting. To, uh, I happened to be here in Texas because I worked out of the San Antonio Mets. And if Anybody isn't familiar with Texas? This is a darn big state. I only covered 77,000 square miles, which is just a, a chunk of Texas, not all of it. Um, but um, I did it. I did. Um, I was I was really good at it because, again, I believed in the mission. I absolutely loved it. Um, loved talking about all the branches of service and um, what they could do for our our nation. Um, but you know what? With that, I did miss the Air Force. I loved working for the Department of Defense, but my heart for the Air Force. So like I said, I do believe blue. Purple's good, but blue's better. Well, we appreciate you sharing your inspiring story with us. It's been an impressive career trajectory, that's for sure. I mean, seriously, how often in the private sector do you kind of like have people bleeding the company colors? But here you are, you see it time and again, just like yourself, people who just love our culture and the mission and the camaraderie that comes with it. Kind of gives you that sense of purpose to get up every day and do the mission over and over again. Um, you know, Brenna, we need to go over to you. I'd very much like to hear about you as well. Maggie has an impressive story, but you've had a pretty impressive trajectory yourself. You know, talk about success stories. If I recall, you were a college student in the very first PSIP, the Premier College Internship Program class. And now here you are, program manager for that exact same program. So please share your story with our audience. Yes, Ryan, I would love to. Well, my name is Brenna Sear and in a nutshell, growing up, both my parents worked for the Air Force Civilian Service. So from day one, I was like, I'm going to do what they do. I want to grow up and be like them. So I was born with blue blood too, just like Miss Maggie, I guess you could say. With my parents working for the Air Force Civilian Service, we also moved around a lot. I have also lived and was even born where Miss Maggie has lived as well. Even at the same time, it's just I was in diapers. <laughs> I also got to visit all around Europe and it was so exciting for me. So as I got older and began to pursue my degree, I came to the realization that not everyone who applies gets to work for the Air Force Civilian Service. Luckily, the stars just aligned for me, and they had started the Premier College intern the very year that I was a junior in college, which is exactly the year that you need to apply to be in the program. Mm -hmm. So I applied for the Premier College intern program, and that is how I got my foot into the door. And that's no easy feat. I mean, each year thousands apply, but I, what, only a few hundred are chosen? I mean, they don't call it premiere by accident, right? That's right. And I had a premiere experience. I did that summer in 2018, and I was able to stay with PSAP part-time throughout the rest of my undergraduate studies. And from then on, my year part-time was super beneficial because it has really set a wonderful foundation for even what I'm doing today. I finished my degree and then I was able to convert into the Palace Acquire or PAC program. And my first rotation with the PAC program ended up being basically the personal assist assistant supporting the PSIP and the PAC and the Copper Cap programs. And then from there, I've worked my way through the diversity inclusion program manager to now the PSIP program manager. And now I get to work on the very programs that started my career in overseeing and improving the program from all angles. And you're doing an amazing job, Brenna, seriously. You know, for those who may want to follow in your footsteps, could you explain a little bit about each internship program, what the different, uh, you know, differentiates the two, or should I say three? I mean, really, when you include Copper Cap? 
Yeah, sure thing. Well, the Premier College Intern Program is a 10 to 12 week summer internship that takes place for college students, typically in their junior year of college who are pursuing a four year degree or higher. We bring them in for a summer experience with us. It's kind of a try before you buy opportunity. They get experience in what the AFCS has to offer and truly envision themselves having a career with us. However, these are not just summer internships. At the end of the summer, when they have successfully completed the PISA program and they feel like the Air Force Civilian Service was a great fit, they'll be offered to be an intern in either the PAC or the COP program upon graduation, which these are the programs that my colleague here, Miss Maggie, oversees. The Palace Acquire and the Copper Cap programs are three-year developmental programs that do lead to a permanent position in the Air Force Civilian Service when successfully completed. So it's not just an internship, but an opportunity for a career. On our website, afintern.com, we say that these internships come with something that others do not, and that is a future, because at the end of the day, you end up with an entire career ahead of you with leadership potential. That's awesome, really, honestly. And, you know, I know the audience will have lots of questions about the many AFCS internship opportunities. And I think at the time, at the end of the, the show tonight, we'll have some time to take care of that, um, answer some of the questions. But in the meantime, if you want to find out about these programs and find detail, just like Ms. Brenna said, I encourage everyone to jot that down. We'll add it in the chat as well. It's afintern.com. Other than Maggie and Brenna themselves, you're really not going to find a better resource in that site. But tonight's webinar is on the exceptional workplace culture AFCS employees enjoy working for the world's most powerful Air Force. So my next question is all about that. To you, Miss Maggie, you've said you bleed Air Force blue. What are those things about this unique culture that gets your blue blood pumping? Well, you know, the work-life balance you hear so much about, well, that's really a thing at the Air Force Civilian Service. It's important, and there's so many opportunities to create that work-life balance. Yeah, like you might have seen a second ago, my cat made a cameo. And that's one of the things that I love working for AFCS. Like I get to work from home and I get to work alongside my pets all day. So that's really awesome. But Miss Maggie is right. The AFCS offers a lot of different options like flexible work schedules, compressed work schedules. And in fact, I work nine hour days so that I can have every other Friday off. And those Fridays happen to fall on Paycheck Friday. So that's when I get to go out and enjoy myself. And we have so many options out there based on your organization or your supervisor. We definitely have the ability to keep that work-life balance. Plus we accrue time off as well. So we are rewarded for the time that you put in. And in my case, I enjoy that every payday. Yeah, and, and to me, the thing I love most about the Air Force Civilian Service is that I get to keep serving. I still feel that connection. I still feel like I, I get that sense of belonging and that mission that's bigger than myself. I love it. I feel like I need it. And um, I mean, this is who I am. So that's the part I love. Well, Maggie, you know, earlier you mentioned that you've done the trifecta of experience with the Air Force. You enlisted, obviously, you became an officer after that, and now you're a civilian. So really, you've experienced all of the different perspectives of workplace culture with the Air Force. Can you talk to us about how the civilian culture differs or is the same as the experience of active duty, aside from the obvious, you know, the uniform mission, the deployment and the challenge? Yeah. Well, you know, it does feel a little different. I mean, I can give you my experience. It does feel a little different because you aren't wearing the uniform, but I do still feel like I'm part of the mission. As I said, that was the biggest part I was missing. Um, so that's why I came back to the Air Force. Civilians do play such an important role in maintaining our mission. You do work alongside our military, but not participating in deployments or having to move, you know, like PCSing when, when mission needs or mission calls. Um, civilians still serve in their own way, but they just don't wear a uniform. Did you know that we make up a third of the Air Force? You know, I didn't know that. I did not know that until I became an Air Force civilian myself. A third of the Air Force. Can't do it without our civilians. Um, it's, an, it's an important, integral part of what we do. Um, and I know, and I actually feel like I'm part of the mission, as I mentioned. Um, we're just as valued, and the Air Force does really work hard to show that. And if you choose, you can deploy if you'd like to, and you can work alongside our men and women in uniform. And it is strictly voluntary, though, if you're a civilian. Um, but if that's something you're interested in, there's that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I have to go back to what you taught me as an instructor. You mentioned an acronym that maybe our audience doesn't know, and that's PCS. 
So we call that a permanent change of station. So just think of it if like your uh, parent or somebody that you know um, you know is working and they had to move from one state to another or from one location to another, we term that as a permanent change of station. It's not a temporary thing where you go and do you know maybe like a business trip. You're actually moving, uprooting, and doing that. So that's something that you see in the the active duty side of things. I did that every three years as a recruiter, um, and uh, now as a civilian, we kind of planted roots and. Yesterday I was in San Antonio. Today I'm in Virginia, but that's again for a little business trip and coming out here for a little powwow with our folks. But um, you're absolutely right, Maggie. I mean, I, I want to ask Brenna kind of the same type of question, but more of a variant. Uh, Brenna, you're a relatively recent grad and you're a young professional and you have a lot of peers, I'm assuming, who are uh, also in the private sector. Can you talk to us about how your experience working with the Air Force and the culture that you're ingrained into? kind of differs from what your peers in the private se sector do? Yes, I think that one of the things that I love most working about the Air Force Civilian Service is that we play a key role for an important mission. You can literally feel the mission, especially in my position, as we are renewing our force. Take engineering as an example. In the private sector, oftentimes you're working on something that may not be as exciting or as rewarding as working on an aircraft and platforms that directly benefit the United States of America. You might be working on a claw machine or soda dispenser or something similar, whereas you're if an engineer, whereas if you are an engineer in the Air Force Civilian Service, you're working on actual planes and platforms that help defend the United States of America. Here, the mission you can see and feel in many ways outweighs any monetary benefit that the private sector can provide. Do you feel like being a part of the Air Force Civilian Service is like equivalent to similar roles in the private sector? Or do you feel like your world's ahead of where you would have been if you had stayed in the private sector? When I talk to my colleagues in the corporate world, they really don't understand like the magnitude of my responsibilities. And I've had many of them say to me, like, I don't even know what you do besides talk because of the things that I that I get to do, like aim higher or host events like the PSIP Symposium. We compare our roles and responsibilities and the level of responsibility that I've been entrusted with, the leadership role I've been given. And it's generally ahead of where they are at the same point in their careers. And I, I do attribute that not only to the workplace culture that we have here, but that is the very culture that the Air Force has placed such a high priority on maintaining their force. The Air Force is intentionally growing our own leaders with programs in place like the PAC and the COP for personal and professional uh, growth with even built in promotions and advances. And not only that, but if you are looking for ways outside of that to grow yourself on your own, we have so many resources out there for you to do that. Um, in the private sector, I just don't think that there's anything similar there. And you're going to have to fight your way up that corporate ladder. I can definitely understand that. And and honestly, that's I, I feel like it's an opportunity being in AFCS, dodging the ladder. <laughs> Because yeah. that's something you can't really put a price tag on. The Air Force, you know, fast tracking you because not only are you needed, but you're valued and you're the key to the success of its mission. So, you know, an Air Force civilian service, I think, like you said, you're going to be worlds ahead because of your leadership potential and the Air Force is going to invest in you to continue to grow that. Nothing does compare. Like we get to brief some amazing people and do some amazing things each year. Each year I briefed to hundreds and hundreds of people and even some who I was in their very own shoes at one point, which I know that if I look back, college Bruno would have not even been able to imagine that I would even be doing. And it's like, OK, so what do you think about, you know, switching to industry? And I just don't think that an industry job would be as rewarding or challenging or satisfying to me as the mission here that you can literally see and feel every day. Yeah. It sounds like you have job satisfaction. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. <laughs> All right, audience, it's time for our second poll this evening. So get those fingers ready. Poll number two, what leadership skill do you feel is most important? We're not talking about the leadership skill within yourself, maybe from somebody that is leading you or somebody that you know. We, we have decisiveness. Is that the most important? Integrity relationship or team building, including the ability to teach and mentor or transparency. So I'll give you about 10 seconds to answer that question and then we'll go over the results with you. All right, looks like we have our answers. So 4% uh, of you said decisiveness. Uh, the next up was transparency at 7%. Integrity was 40%, but our winner this, not, this evening was the relationship or team building, including the ability to teach and mentor. 49% of our audience said that that was what they would choose is best. Wow. 
uh, is and most important in a leader. So, you know, we've talked a lot about these traits with our panelists. Um, ever since COVID, social distancing and kind of the emergence of platforms like Zoom, Teams meetings, remote work has really swept the nation and kind of changed some things. So Maggie, can you take a moment and discuss the opportunities telework uh, has given us and, and how it affects the workplace culture? You know, are there like activities to keep that cohesion you'd find working in person? What do you think? Yes, when you said activities, it's room for activities. I was thinking of Step Brothers. <laughs> um, I think I do think it's important to make that distinct distinction between telework and remote work. And, you know, they are different. Uh, telework is much more common with the Air Force because remote work can be from any location, while telework is from a prescribed distance, um, which is what Brenna and I do. Um, since team, since our particular team is teleworking, um, we do make it a point to meet at least once a week, you know, like staff meeting or, um, you know, touch point meetings. Um, and we do also have an occasional gathering, um, you know, to just, just to get together and do like a quick gut check and do team building activities. Well, activities. Now you've got me on, on that, Ryan. Um, our, in our division, we do have over 200 people. And uh, we do optional lunches, um, you know, depending on what side of San Antonio you're at, they do make different options to make things easy. But um, if you're not the type of person who likes to telework, and there are some who are out there who don't really care to telework, you can also like to go into your office and, um, and go in there, and that's fine too. But they're always also constantly doing surveys and kind of touch points to make sure that you are getting the type of um, support mentally, physically, um, you know, your equipment, making sure your connections are working, because um, we do want you to excel and, um, you know, make sure that you're comfortable. Um, we do have something that's actually kind of fun. We have something twice a week. It's called Morning Muster. And, um, oh, my goodness, it's fun to get on there every morning just for a few minutes, um, just twice a week. And people razz each other, poke at each other like your football We have team. a joke of the day. <laughs> yes, the joke of the day. Oh, my heavens. And our division leader, she's so awesome. She does the... Someone gave her a book of some kind of jokes and stuff. It's just fun. It's <sighs> fun to just kind of just have that camaraderie. Yeah. I, I really believe in that. It's just fun. And then we have something called Five Minutes to Thrive. Um, always like good little tidbits. Um, they don't even necessarily take five minutes. It's just a couple of minutes, but um, just good, insightful things. Um, and it's just very deliberate. It's it's really nice. It's just we just have a really good system in place, and um, we do check ins and make sure everybody's good. So. Again, it's been really good, and um, it depends if you're the type of person who likes to go in. We have that option, and if you prefer to telework, you you can have the option to. And again, I need to make that clear. That's for our particular work area. It doesn't work for everyone. Some in many instances, you do have to physically go in because that's just the type of job and role it is. Very cool. You know, you mentioned joke of the day. <laughs> I can't pass up this opportunity to give you guys a quick dad joke. Oh okay. Lord, what is it? What's a pirate's oh, favorite yeah. letter? Is it R? No, it's the C. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Yeah, I, I did. love it. It's awesome. All right. Oh, now, both you and Brenda have worked with students and recent grads in your roles with Force Renewal. Thank you for that, by the way. And overseeing AFCS's internship programs. That being the case, Brenna, please compose yourself. What advice can you give those who may be watching regarding how they can improve their chances of succeeding? Well, I will caveat that I saw quite a few names as uh, they were logging in, and I know there's some of my future Premier College interns who are starting this summer on here. So Love listen that. up. I know um, a few things. I think being open-minded and having a go-getter attitude is definitely key because that makes you stand out. It's also critical to just show that you are motivated and that you are adaptable. Sometimes you might be thrown into an unfamiliar scenario, something outside your wheelhouse, like, hey, can you lead this working group or can you be a featured panelist? And we're really looking for those who can rise to the occasion and show creativity and initiative because our goal is to develop future leaders and by leading and supporting them along the way. So if you're presented an opportunity to develop yourself and maybe boost your confidence in yourself, go for it because if someone believes in you, then you can do it. You'll be surprised that even in a few short months or even a year, what you're going to be doing is going to be so much bigger and you just don't even realize it yet. You're going to no. be prepped for something bigger than what you're doing at this moment. Sorry. Yeah. You, well, you know, you mentioned future panelists. Now I'm going to, I'm going to put this out to the audience right now. Okay. This is totally ad-libbed. I'm not going off a script, but if you're <laughs> watching this tonight 
and you go through this program and you find yourself in AFCS in the very near future, which we hope you are, mm -hmm. I want y'all to connect with us on LinkedIn and reach out to me with your story, okay? So that we can make you a panelist on a future Aim Higher episode, because we will cover these programs again in the future. We try to do this at least once a year where we can kind of highlight. So that's my challenge to the audience, all right? Brenna, thank you for the info and sharing. I'm hoping somebody picks up on that. We have a, a future panelist on Aim Higher in our midst <laughs> at the moment. All right, Maggie, same question. Same question to you, Maggie. What can they do to kind of set themselves apart? Um, well, you know, there's just so many different things that you can do, but I, I'm going to say just always show up. Always show up, put your best foot forward, give it 110%. We have such an amazing mission. I cannot tell you how much I love the Air Force. If you haven't figured it out, I love the Air Force. Um, so we support more than just the Air Force. You know, we, we support the Space Force. Now we are the Department of the Air Force. So it takes all of us to do our part. So if you're lucky enough to be with the Air Force Civilian Services team, put your best foot forward and just give it all you have. Um, and you and you will succeed. We're gonna help you succeed and we want you to succeed. So it's just an enjoyable team. So lean into it and be part of that team and step up and show up. You know, as, as we mentioned before, the team that you're speaking of obviously is comprised of uh, active duty in uniform, other civilian employees, and occasionally our industry partners. Uh, I know it, I know personally it's an interesting work dynamic, but in your roles, you and Brenna, do you find yourselves working equally right now with active duty and civilian colleagues? Like what's the mix like there? Well, where Brenna and I actually work, we're all civilian. You know, we are all civilians. Um, so <laughs> yeah, in the division we're at now, it is called the civilian, like town management division is just for civilians. However, of those civilians, there is a healthy mix of prior military like Miss Maggie. In my first rotation, when I was a premier college intern, I did work side by side with military. So I did get to see both worlds. And that's why it is so good to work with people like Miss Maggie, because while I didn't come through the track that she did, and I don't have that prior military experience, she has helped blend both worlds for me. There will be terms and stuff that I really don't understand because I didn't come through the military, but she helps explain that for me. Meanwhile, um, we get to you know lean off both of each other. And I get to use Brenna's brilliant mind. I'm telling you, this girl is brilliant. I bring personality. She brings the brains. <laughs> yeah, that's our, that's our deal. That's our deal. Well, yeah, we have that work out. Y'all have definitely sold me. So for those interested in learning more about AFCS, this is our plug moment, right? And how it supports the Air Force mission. What do you recommend, Maggie? <laughs> well, uh, gosh, there's so many. Uh, where to begin? For general, general information on the Air Force Civilian Service, the place to start is definitely Air Force Civilian Service website, afcivilliancareers.com. It hosts just about every resource under the sun. Mm -hmm. And for specific questions about AFCS internships, which happens to be my favorite website, you can hop directly over to afintern.com. That's afintern.com. <laughs> Plus, our hiring managers are a great resource. You can email them directly or contact contact them on LinkedIn. And when it comes to learning about the workplace culture or a particular career field, one of our most informative resources is past AIM hires. I can't tell you how many times I've had people reach out to me say, hey, and I'm thinking, how do they get my name? It's because they listen to a past AIM hire. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a great resource, too. Um, and you can find our past AIM hire on our AFCS website on, at, excuse me, at AF Civilian Careers forward slash AIM hire forward slash dot com. And I know they're putting the links there in the, in the chat. Yeah, we're going to add all of the links tonight. So I appreciate you helping us with that, uh, Maggie. Mm -hmm. Brenna, you know, we've talked about, Maggie mentioned being a prior, our prior uh, panelist on here. I think this is your third show now, Brenna. It is um, my third one, awesome. yes. So, so again, we have someone from the audience to take Brenna's place for next year. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm <hanging laughs> but I don't mind having friend. you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Brenna, I understand the PSIP internship symposium is coming up. We're really excited about that. Why don't you tell our audience a little more about that? Like, what is most exciting for you? The piece of symposiums are a lot of fun. They are an all hands on deck experience. We bring all 500 interns. We split them into two groups that we've just hired for this summer. And we're going to take them to one of two locations. 
This summer, we're going to go to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and then Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. And the symposium is a complete introduction, acculturation, immersion into the air and space force culture. They're going to get to hear from senior leaders. They're going to get to go on base tours. And most of all, I think is really important. They're going to get to network with other premier college interns who are in their shoes. And I think that was one of the most memorable things about my premier college intern experiences. Those folks that I met at the premier college intern symposium, I am still really great friends with today. We're going to get to do base tours, as I mentioned, and in Ohio, they're going to get to visit the world famous National Museum of the Air Force. They'll get to spend three days with us at this event, just learning all about their new role and seeing how they're going to fit in the Air Force civilian service. So it really is just a celebration of these students, incredible accomplishments, because after all, they do not call us a premier college intern program for nothing. Thousands of students have applied, but only a few hundred are chosen. So it really is something to celebrate and to set the tone for their entire internship. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you that have not seen that National Museum of the Air Force in, in Ohio, that it is impressive. Like it it's just awesome. keeps going. Every time you turn a corner, there's like another giant hangar that you're going to walk through. It's really cool. So mm -hmm. very cool. Uh, Maggie, do you guys have anything similar for like Copper Cap and Palace Acquire to the PSIP Symposium? Yes, we actually do. So Brenda's program is the Premier College Intern Program, and her program is a feeder into my program. The program is the Palace Acquire and Copper Cat program, which have been around for over 40 plus years. Um, but we work on a different hiring timeline um, than her program, the Premier College Intern Program. Um, um, the PAT and Copper Cat, for short, um, is a two to three year development program versus the 10 to 12 week summer internship. And because of that, it has roughly a 2,500 enrolled at, in the program year round. So we're constantly rotating as one or two move out, we're, we're moving them in, you know, we're keeping a constant rotation. So it's called a steady state. So um, bringing our interns together as Brenna, we get asked this a lot, do we do we bring them together and do an, a symposium as she does? And those are pretty fun. They're exhausting, but they're fun. We, we uh, my program is in setup to do it, to do that type of setup. So I don't get to host a symposium. But we do have other ways to keep in contact with our PACs and copper caps. We do host monthly town halls. And during those town halls, we have our um, interns, our, our palace of and copper caps, discuss topics um, and get to get to communicate with each other through, um, through those channels. And um, the town hall topics are based off of any feedback because we do surveys and feedback and um, see what kind of um, topics they want to hear about. So... It's run a little bit differently, but it's still very, very, uh, it's just, it's an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Well, you know, that makes a good segue for my next question as far as, you know, when students can do this. But for our students and recent grads, when can they apply to each program? I will talk about for recent graduates, since our Copper Caps and Palace of Fires are year round, you can apply year round. Again, go to afintern.com <laughs> and Brenna can uh, can talk about her program. Okay. Yeah, for the Premier College Intern Program, we be begin selecting interns in August. So the best time to apply in your academic career is when you're right at that 60 credit mark. Typically, that might fall in December of your junior year, which is the perfect time to apply. The specific career fields and majors that we're looking for include cybersecurity, IT, science and engineering, contracting, civil engineering, business, and finance. Depending on your interest in your major, you can be placed at any one of more than 40 locations across the United States. You must be a U.S. citizen, and we do have a GPA requirement of at least 2.95, and that is your cumulative GPA. You must be from an accredited institution, and it also must be a nonprofit. And lastly, you need to be enrolled full time. And for our master's candidates, if you are pursuing a master's degree, you have to have at least 15 uh, graduate school hours completed by the time you start in the program. OK, well, one of the reasons I love hosting AIM Hire is that I get to kind of absorb all this information and along with the dedication and enthusiasm of guests like you and Brenna, Maggie. It's very infectious. Ever since the day I met you, Maggie, I just like you feed off of it. Brenna, for you, what is it about your workplace culture that you find most appealing? I would definitely think that innovation, um, because 
our programs here, the PSIP, the Palace Acquire, the Copper Cap, they're here to bring innovation and to re to revitalize our force. So it bleeds into my position. It is that we want to render the force and infuse innovation and creativity into the Air Force and the Space Force cultures. Leadership sees the need and recognizes the need and pushes us to be innovative so that we can maintain our position as the world's greatest Air Force. And there's a supportive culture and there's an innovation culture that allows us to be collabor collaborative across the nation as well. Um, overall, that is what makes the AFCS really rewarding because our programs extend nationwide and across the globe. So when we host a symposium and bringing everybody together, you get to see so much promise in the future. And it's just extremely rewarding. And it's so obvious that leadership does invest and does care about it. And it sees that nurturing its civilian workforce as a priority. You know, you mentioned earlier that you are still friends with a lot of the folks that you went through your program with. Do you have any stories that you can share about the experience, like with students and recent grads and staying in touch with folks? Of course, like almost by default, especially after the PSIP symposiums and they hear my story and how these programs started my career as well. And now I'm here in this seat. I almost naturally become a peer mentor or, you know, mentor to these interns. And they look up to me because I went through the program as well. And I hear from them almost constantly. And they'll ask me, when do you think is the best time for me to pursue my master's or other pertinent questions to their career track? And I keep up with them after they've even completed the program. And I may ask them to be part of my symposium panel and brief piece up to the next class and get them excited. Um, one story that does stand out is back in 2020, the year that COVID hit, we had to go completely virtual. And that didn't really allow us to make that personal connection that we strive for. Um, and as a result, it was going to be a shortened internship. And we were worried that that was going to have um, less of an impact on the students. But it turns out that it ended up being one of the internships where we got to spend the most time with them because we saw them face to face on camera a lot. And we got to spend so much time with them. We got to know them very well. And following that internship, I got a phone call from a premier college intern. And she told me that she really appreciated the guidance that I provided throughout the internship and she needed help with her career path and where she should go with her degree. It really wasn't aligning um, with the position she was in and she wanted my help. Well, when I heard about her degree and how closely it aligned with the position I was currently doing, I was like, I think we needed her on it on my team. You know, kind of looking back, I was like, why did I recruit somebody to be my position? But I spoke with my supervisor and and within the next couple of weeks, we were able to bring her on our team. And she has been an incredible asset ever since. And that ended up being my one of the most rewarding things because I was not only able to help her, but she has also grown. And she's about to get her GS12 this summer as well. That's awesome. You know, it sounds like you're saying networking works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I love how works. we get to kind of keep growing our circle of friends with prior coworkers. Uh, how about you, Maggie? Do you have a similar story that you can point to where you just kind of knew you were making a difference in someone's life or, you know, something that brought you particular satisfaction? Hmm. Well, um, at, right off the top of my head, I'm thinking, well, every time I complete either a webcast or a webinar um, or a town hall, I do get a, a handful of emails, well, maybe more than a handful of emails or text messages from interns telling me just how grateful they are and or that I help solve a particular problem. Um, sometimes I just don't know where to go. So um, I've been sitting in this particular seat for six months as the Palace of and Copper Cap Program Manager. So um, developing those ways of communicating has been so satisfying because I love helping people because I love the Air Force um, and I just love what, uh, what we do. So um, it's very satisfying when people reach out and say, hey, thanks. I didn't know that, or now I know where to go. So um, I love knowing that they can reach out to me. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I'm going to help them and and direct them to the right to the right person. So um, you know, like I said, we can recruit all day long, but if we can't keep them and can't retain them, then what's the point? Um, I love, love, love the role that I play, and um, I just I love what I do. So if they're happy, I'm happy, and uh, they love the trick. I love the trajectory and career path that I'm on. So it's a win-win for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Maggie, becoming part of the Air Force isn't something that just happens. And you've been doing this for a long time. Well, what was the motivation <laughs> that kind of solidified your decision to join? Well, um, you know, I have been doing this for a while. Uh, let me take you back to when I was 18 years old. Ultimately, um, knowing that the Air Force provided me job security and training, as I mentioned 
you know, I was like, I had a full ride um, track scholarship. I was like, what am I going to do? I don't want to keep doing that. I was tired of um, running and stuff. I needed a job. I wanted to get married. And I've been married for 34 years now. Um, and that's actually why I initially joined. Um, but why I stayed was for that sense of belonging, that sense of camaraderie and that unique culture that we've been talking about all evening. I stayed because of the mission. Um, I've been talking about that mission. And once I got my degree and I could have chosen other careers, but I, I love the Air Force. Again, cut me, I bleed blue. Um, and once I did retire, I, I was missing, missing that mission. And I, I found it by coming back and becoming a civilian. So as a civilian, I still felt the same way and I still feel that sense of belonging. I just, I'm just drawn to it. So that's what's important to me. And that's what I, I love. I love it. You're working around good people all the time. Yes, I do. I mean, I they really say do. like you should find something you love because it won't feel like work. And I mean, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, now we know. We know why you've got that blue blood coursing through your veins. Um, <laughs> what about the civilians who haven't had that active duty experience like yourself, myself? I mean, Brenna's one of them, but did they bleed blue yeah. like you? I mean, we know Brenna, Brenna probably bleeds blue, but I'm not going <laughs> to encourage you to find out. Let's not sort of <laughs> something crazy she was born like that. Into it. <laughs> not gonna find out. <laughs> well, you know, like she said, she was kind of born into it, but look at her. She is the perfect example of a civilian. And um, just like you described, she's been with the Air Force for six years. And I'm telling you, she can run circle or circles around people who've been around for 30 plus years. Um, her passion and commitment to the Air Force is, is untouchable. Um, with that work-life balance we were talking about, um, it's, you know, it is a thing and, and we, it's really important to take care of all that, but, um, but sometimes we can't seem to turn it off because we're, you know, we're also not just coworkers um, and, but we're also friends and sometimes we'll be out doing things. We'll be like, Hey, what do you think about this symposium? Or what are we going to do about this? So sometimes you know, the mission we, calls. sometimes yeah, the mission is we can't just turn it off. <laughs> yeah. We just turn it off. Sometimes it's just, it's, it, it's in our blood. So, uh, but that's our choice. And uh, we, you know, we love what we do and we believe in it. Yeah. Brenna, well, thank you, Maggie. Brenna, same question I have to ask. Becoming part of the Air Force, honestly, it's not something that just happens. It's like I told mm -hmm. Maggie. What was the deciding factor for you? Like what solidified your decision? Yes, I'll definitely take y'all back to my piece of summer. And I'm thinking that I'm just a student. I thought that there'd be limitations of that, right? I'm a premier college intern. This is the first summer started. Nobody knows what this is, but the team I was assigned to fully accepted me as a team member. There was this one person in particular who just swooped me up under her wing. And that's when I was learning terms that we use like wingman, right? And she was like, you're my wingman, you're my wingwoman. And we were going, and she was telling me, we're going to get you trained. You're going to get so up to speed. And she never looked at me like, a GS4, a GS5, she never grade locked me. And she trained me so well. And even when she wasn't there, say she had to take off work, she had something ready for me. And she definitely took care of me. It was more like becoming a part of a family and joining the team. And that's what makes me feel so good. Even when she wasn't there to mentor me, she gave me that confidence, like you got this. And that made me feel so great. And that is family. And that's what really solidified and sold it um, for me. And to this day, I'm still friends with other interns from this class. And I, and I know where they rotated to. And I'm like, you know what, I know that this person sits over here, I'm going to ping them because I know I can ask that question. I've built my network. And I think that the camaraderie that we were able to build throughout that summer has really just honed into me like this is going to be a family that I'm going to have, you know, for the rest of my career, for sure. All right. So on the flip side of that question for both of you, and Maggie, we can start with you. Before you made that decision, was there anything that initially made you almost pass up the Air Force? No. <laughs> <laughs> I already no. knew you were going to say that. I mean, like, like no. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Brenna, what about you? <laughs> And, and no, and I think that was almost to a fault, right? I was so confident. I was like, I'm putting my application for the Premier College intern and I got my acceptance acceptance letter and I became so focused on the Premier College intern. I didn't even consider any second options. Once I was introduced to the program, the mission and the camaraderie, like it was clear I made the right choice and I never second guessed my decision for even a single moment. Well, that's got to be a really good feeling. Thank you. For yeah. sure. All right, audience, before we open up the questions, for y'all to ask us because I think we're running close to time. We got about seven and a half minutes left here. I do have one more for Brenna and Maggie. Mm -hmm. um, what's the one thing 
about Air Force civilian service culture that you feel just takes the cake over other or, or uh, other organizations? Easy. I, I'll go ahead and go. Just the sense of belonging and that camaraderie. You can't get it. I mean, you can. I guess you can get it anywhere else, but it's not easy. It's easy in the Air Force. Yeah. A department of the Air Force. I'm going to say a rewarding position. And like Ryan, like you referred to probably that job satisfaction. I think I know myself and I know that, you know, I like achievement focused. I like to be rewarded. And I think that definitely here at the Air Force Civilian Service, I feel that and I feel that mission and just feel like I'm contributing to something that's so much bigger than myself. Great answers, honestly. And <laughs> I, I, right on par with my expectations, I'd expect nothing less. So thank you both for sharing that. All right, audience, we have a few minutes remaining. We're gonna open up the floor to your unanswered questions. I know that our uh, recruiters on our team have been behind the scenes asking some stuff or answering some stuff uh, through the Q&A feature. If you haven't submitted your questions through the Q&A feature, you can definitely do that now. For everyone else, um, just stand by. I'm gonna pull some. I actually have one of our folks standing by sending me a few here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just read through these really fast here. All right, here's a great one. Um, I know we covered the difference between the copper cap and PAC programs, but mm -hmm. either of you kind of uh, give any advice or things that you wish you knew at the start of, of like your career. I, and Brenda, this might be more for you, but what what's something you wish you would have known before entering the intern program? Oh my gosh, that's so hard. I wish I would have known all the acronyms and everything that there is to know. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not too sure. That's really hard. I feel like, I, you know, something actually I wish I would have known um, is that you're going to be asked to do a lot of things that are going to be out of your comfort level. Like, I, I really mean that. Like, as one time I was left there, like, plan, plan this visit. Students are coming. And I wish I would have known that. If someone's asking you to do this or someone believes in you, you have it too. Cause I would, that would have eliminated so much, maybe nerves or anxiety that maybe I can't do this, but if someone believes in you, you got to bloom where you're planted. You got to rise to the occasion and, and you got it. I think that's something I wish I would have known. Okay. So kind of like a believe in yourself moment. Like you wish. You yeah, for it. sure. Like, mm -hmm. You got this. Okay, cool. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. All right. I believe me, she does. She can run <laughs> yeah, circles. I'm you. I saw, her, I, I saw her in action last year during the, the symposium and I was like, okay, wow. Wow. Maggie was right. right. Yeah. Guys and bears. All right. Maggie, I think this one uh, you kind of touched on. So I'm going to let you answer this one. Can civilians, can we work abroad? Yes, we can. Civilians, we do. We are stationed overseas. And, uh, and, and Brenda actually mentioned that her parents were stationed in Germany and Japan. Um, yes. We do have, um, as long as there's a position there and you apply for it and you get it, yes, we can. Absolutely. And how fun is that? <laughs> awesome. I wouldn't oh. mind going to Japan, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I didn't get to deploy a lot or, or, or go overseas <laughs> when I was active duty Air Force, but I would take a, well, I don't know, I'd have to talk to my wife first. <laughs> we still yeah, got kids that went through high school. But, yeah, uh, maybe after high school, you'll retire there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see here. Um, this is a great one. Either one of you can answer. Uh, are you required to stay in a role for a certain period of time? Probably, I guess it depends on the on the particular, if we're talking about a certain program or not. Um, so if you're talking, I'm going to, how about this? If you're in a particular um, developmental program, mm -hmm. then the answer, I guess it depends, I guess. Um, yeah, if you're in the PAC, the Palace Acquire or the Copper Cap program, those are two to three year developmental programs. So there will be, if you take any kind of recruitment incentive, you may be expected to stay in that program. Now your role, like your position, what you may do might change, but you will still be considered in that developmental program. After you've completed that program, that is when your career will be in your own hands. The world is going to be your oyster. And that is when you can move around and try different things. Hopefully that helps. Oh, yeah. I, I, it does. Actually, that's a great segue for our probably for our final question of the evening. Somebody asked, are there specific leadership development programs in each sector within AFCS? Like a, develop, those developmental programs you're talking about, but like more specifically geared towards leadership. I mean, Brenda, I think you had a great uh, like you mentioned it earlier. You had a great example where somebody was kind of helping mold you. And and I mean, you were a four mm -hmm. before 12 now, right? 
Yeah, four to a twelve. And so, so for those of you that don't know the GS scale, you can look it up on 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 your uh, search engine, um, and it'll kind of lay it out. But I mean, it goes all the way. I think it taps out at fifteen. But you can look up what 15. that looks like. But going from a four to a to a twelve is no nothing to <laughs> to. to yeah, I always say that I'm racing my dad, so I'm trying to get to where he is before he got to where he is. So that's my goal. But yeah, for developmental programs, um, we have something called civilian development, and that is all about your personal and professional development. And they have courses, and they're going to be defined by like what grade you are currently and like where you are at in your career. So it can be really anything. Something that I did was called the Emerging Leaders course, and that is something I did I think a year and a half ago. Me and my colleague did that, and that is that's just one thing that you can also learn to put on your resume, right? Learn how to be a leader, and it would think it was like a six weeks course, six week course, and you how to write papers, but I mean, they're helping develop you. Um, there are, there's more to it. It's a plethora of classes that you can take, but yes, there's plenty of opportunities to develop your leadership skills. Very cool. If you have a desire, it's there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm assuming the person that asked that question has some type of desire for that. So thank you. For <laughs> All right. So the, the last question that we have, I'm not actually going to answer, but I'm going to utilize this to our benefit. So somebody asked, what does a typical day as a civilian look like? That is a long question that we could go into for a very long time. It's obviously going to be different for everybody, but my encouragement is to stay tuned because we do have an episode at some point that we uh, kind of touch back on called a day in the life of, or a day in the life. Highly encourage y'all taking a look. Maggie mentioned it earlier. We'll put the link in the chat, but you can go to AF Civilian Careers dot com slash aim higher to find all our episodes we're also on youtube and a lot of other places but we do have to wrap up this evening maggie brenna thank you so much for joining us it was a pleasure to have you all on the show thank, thank you for being generous with your time i know it's after hours uh audience members we hope you enjoyed hearing from some of our air force leaders it's clear that they're making people uh making people their priority and what they're doing and honestly, they're both just very positive and pro productive in their supportive work environments with their teams and have had that kind of experience themselves. So again, if you would like to learn more about becoming an Air Force civilian, visit afcivilliancareers.com, where you can also sign up for email alerts on our jobs and upcoming events. And just a reminder that any of the resources we mentioned will be linked in the chat box tonight. We'll also post the recording from this webinar plus the resource links to the AFCS website at afcmilliancareers.com. And if you've subscribed, you actually get notifications about when the, the uh, recording will drop to you. So uh, I want to also encourage you before we go, join us next month on Wednesday, April 3rd at 6 p.m. Central for our next episode. Until then, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebooks. Well, all the Facebooks, just not, not just one of them. For more tips and hot bombs. <laughs> And that's my cue to say good night. Thank you for joining us. I'm clearly messing up and going off script, but thank you all. Appreciate I see a lot of my Premier College interns. I hope to see y'all soon. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Maggie, Brenna, thank you. You have a pleasant evening. Be safe and good night. Awesome. Thank you for having us. <laughs>